And good morning again, Valley Brook. So good to be with you, as I said. And I wanted to mention to you that after the message this morning, uh, Grace White will be offering a, a word of a song of worship and praise for, uh, for all of us to enjoy and to participate in and give thanks to the Lord. I also want to thank our uh, production crew who's here this morning, Chris Mills and Marlo Barnes and the lovely Avon and Lynn Dorsey, <laughs> sitting back at the sound booth looking like such a cute couple and uh, with their masks on and everything. But God bless you, and it's great to be here with you. Let's jump right into today's message. It's titled, Divine Love by Human Delivery. Divine Love by Human Delivery. I really appreciate the scripture that my wife read during our offertory prayer and uh, during our offertory during the announcements and prior to the offertory prayer about the Lord's love enduring forever. God is love and his love endures forever. And we're going to speak about that divine love by human delivery this morning. So if you would not, would not mind rather turning to 1 Thessalonians. Our text will be coming from the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 1 through 11. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. First Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. Now, brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And I just want to pause for a moment here and, and, and note the similarity between what we're reading here and for those of you who were with us last week when we were going through the book of, when we were looking at Acts chapter 1, how the angels said to the disciples as they gazed at Jesus as he ascended, they said to him, they said to the disciples that the same Jesus that you see going up into heaven this way will come back in the very same way. So Paul uh, reiterates that theme here. He's saying that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night while people are saying peace and safety. We're in verse 3. Destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you brothers are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. Amen. Verse 11 is my main idea today. So if you're taking notes, you've got the, the, the title of the message, Divine Love by Human Delivery, and verse 11 is the main idea. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. 1 Thessalonians is one of the first letters written by the Apostle Paul. Some believe that the very first was the book of Galatians, and there's some debate about whether Galatians preceded this one, but this is certainly one of the very first. And he wrote this to these Thessalonian believers to clear up some confusion that they had about the day of the Lord and when Jesus was coming back. Some even thought that he'd already come back. And so Paul wrote this letter to clear up for them 
this amazing and fantastic truth that we all hope for and hope in and believe to be an event that will eventually take place. The physical reappearing of the Lord Jesus Christ to earth to receive those who have put their faith in him. They were real excited about this, but they were worried that maybe it already happened. So Paul wrote this letter to straighten that out. I think their example of being really excited about it is one that we should follow, that we should continue to fix our eyes on that day, on that hope, on that eventuality when we see our Lord Jesus face to face. And so he was writing this letter to straighten out their, their facts, but he's also writing it just in general to encourage these precious, precious believers. So the main idea being encourage one another and build each other up. This is not new. If you've been coming to Valley Brook for any time or if you've been tuning in, you know that this is a theme that we talk about a whole, whole lot. My goal today is not to reveal anything new to you. My goal today is to increase the value of this truth to you, of this familiar truth. Because what happens is with familiarity comes contempt. And we tend to look at things that are familiar and we don't give them the value that they deserve because we know them intellectually. So my goal this morning is to, as we continue to talk about the church this month, my goal is to refresh your view and increase the value of this one phrase, encourage one another and build each other up. In the context of this particular chapter, again, Paul is referring to encouraging one another in the knowledge of the Lord's return. That's what he's talking about specifically, um, that this life is not the end, that this part of the story that we're in, as my wife said, we don't know whether it's just gotten worse or if our, our eyes have gotten foggier, but this part of the story is not the end of the story and that there is so much more to come, that this life is not the end. So he's encouraging them specifically with that in this particular verse in its context. But this verse is a sibling verse to others, like Ephesians 4.16, which is a verse I think I've referenced in every single message I've given this month. But please pardon me, brothers and sisters, I can't help it. Ephesians 4.16 is one of my favorite verses. It's like vanilla ice cream and pound cake. It's like banana pudding to me. It is a joy and a delight to consider and to think about it because it is a marvelous truth. And it's connected to our main idea. And the verse specifically says this. From him, this is Ephesians 4.16, from him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. In fact, our text verse here in 1 Thessalonians, it not only has is related to Ephesians 4.16, it has many siblings in the New Testament. This isn't the only place that this idea appears, and any time the Lord repeats something over and over again, it's because he wants us to remember it over and over again, and he wants us to value it over and over again. And what I like about the verse there in Ephesians 4.16 is how, how um, inclusive it is of everyone. It says from him, the whole body, the whole body. And then it says, joined and held together by every supporting ligament. And it says, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And I spoke about this last week when I was talking about how the Lord wants to build his church through you. So this particular verse has many siblings in the New Testament. So it not only applies to encouraging each other about our eternal destiny, as we see here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, but it also involves encouraging each other about who God is to us and who we are to him in this life in general. It applies to encouraging one another as we deal with loss. So 
Some of us are, are dealing with the loss of loved ones. This verse applies to encouraging one another as we deal with loss, as we deal with adversity. And who doesn't know what adversity is and who isn't dealing with adversity at this time? And the trials and the, the travails and the, the, the tribulations of this life. We need encouragement. Can I stop for a moment and, and make a make it plain statement? We need encouragement. We need encouragement. It doesn't matter how strong our faith is. It doesn't matter how long we've been walking with the Lord. It doesn't matter how good things are right now. We need encouragement. And so Paul's exhortation to us here from 1 Thessalonians is relevant to each one of us. And I want to illustrate with the rest of my time why it is so critical for us to value this truth and not just kind of Okay, I got it. Because we don't got it. <laughs> we don't got it. I don't got it. That's why I'm talking about it. And I've been preaching about it and singing about it and writing songs about it. The first song I put to music was about encouraging people. Encouragement's a matter of choice. But there is a profound truth in this that I think God wants to extract for us and give it increased value to us as we consider it this morning. So, we live in an era where we, um, we're focused on healthy living. Well, God has given us here in his word a healthy church plan. A healthy church plan. You know, there's all kinds of churches. And I pray and I want God to give us a healthy church. And if you are listening in, I pray that God would continue to make your church a healthy church, and you have a critical role to play in that happening. See, a healthy church is not just about the preaching. If the only thing that's keeping a person at a church is the preaching, it's not a healthy church. There is something more that God wants us to experience in our fellowship with one another than just what we hear on Sunday morning or what's being sung on Sunday morning or the ministries that are being distributed distributed through the church. There is something deeper, more meaningful, more precious. Not that those things aren't, but there is something that God wants us to get from this verse and all of its siblings that I think is extremely important for us as we seek to be the healthy church that God wants us to be. His word consists of the church being strengthened in divine love by human delivery from each part of the body. That's God's healthy church plan. I'll say it again. His healthy church plan consists of the church being strengthened in divine love through our own individual walks with God by human delivery from each part of the body. From each part of the body. You know, I said earlier that we need encouragement. Let me break it down and tell you personally. I'm tired. I wrote this in my journal the other day. And I told my wife as I was walking around. I said, you know, honey. I'm just tired. I was feeling tired that day. And I, and I wrote in my journal. I'm sensing emotional and mental fatigue. Trying to cope with all that's going on in our country. All that's going on in the world these days. I mean, even the illusion of stability has been taken away. And it is an illusion, by the way. Stability and control that we thought we had before all this started was just an illusion. Because we really didn't have stability. Everything's always changing and we certainly didn't have control. But at least it was an illusion that we could sort of rest on a little bit until reality came knocking and shoved us off of it. But now even the illusion of stability has been taken away because it's not there on our jobs. Can't feel secure on our jobs. It's not there with our health. We thought, boy, if we just did reasonably good things, you know, took care of ourselves, we, it was on us whether or not we were healthy or not. But it ain't on us now. The illusion that we're in control of our health has been taken away. It's not there for our kids. 
thought if we feed our kids a certain way and we watched out for them, they could be healthy. It's the, that illusion has been taken away. It's not there with our routines. Yesterday, my wife was going to go to the Dutch market, which we call the Amish market because the Amish run it. She was going to go to the Dutch market and pick up something for Sunday dinner, which is something that she normally does on a Saturday. But she told me when she came back that the market, trying to be COVID compliant, had a line extending out of the door that went all the way down the sidewalk and hooked around to other stores around the corner. So needless to say, we didn't get that thing for dinner tonight. <laughs> we won't be having that thing for dinner tonight. All of our routines have just been thrown up in the air. We're in just such a state of, of, of uh, chaos. The social and political climate of our country, the upheaval is calling, causing all of us to scratch our heads wondering where this thing is going. Now, I don't know about you, but I love Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I spend a whole lot of time with Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I enjoy being with the Lord's people. But I can tell you, despite all of my spiritual assets and resources and schemes and strategies, I need some encouragement. I need encouragement. And I don't need just the convenience pack. I need the BJs. I need the big, huge sacks that you drag out and can barely lift into your trunk. That's the kind of encouragement I need. I don't know about you. You may be good. If you're good, then you don't really need to listen to this message. But I'm not good. And that's why I'm talking about it. And maybe that's why I'm feeling this so profoundly that we need encouragement from one another. I didn't know how stressed out I was. I didn't know how, how um, dismal and, and how drained I was feeling. It just hit me all of a sudden. We're just dealing with so much stuff. Do we really even realize how much stuff we're dealing with? Amen. But Paul says to them, encourage one another. And he says these words, just as you also are doing. See, these believers didn't need to hear this for the first time. Paul's not saying, hey, I want you to understand something. They understood it. Mm -hmm. They were doing it just as you all understand it and you are doing it. But he said, just as you're also doing it, I'm still telling you about it. I'm still reminding you of it. I'm still exhorting you. I'm telling you to not let your, pet, your foot off the pedal. Don't go into cruise control. Don't assume that it's happening just because you know about it. You hear what I'm saying? Don't assume that it's happening just because you know about it. I want you to encourage one another just as you are doing. Sometimes we just need to be exhorted to keep doing what we're doing. To keep believing what we're believing. And as I said, to not let up on the gas. So I want to give a big old shout out to all the church builders of the Lord out there. I mentioned this last week. Church builders are people who are not just expanding the church by adding new people to it, but who are encouraging the brethren and building up the brothers and sisters who are a part of the Lord's body as this text is directing us. So I want to give a big shout out to all of you church builders, all of you with whom he's building his church. I want to tell you as the pastor of this church, and I'm sure that for those of you who are listening, who are not a member, are not members of our church, I know your pastors probably could say the same thing. I hope that he can, but I am honored. I am privileged and I am delighted to be a part of a community of believers where I am prouder of the church builders than I am the church building. Because what is taking place inside the church is far more important than how the church looks on the outside or even what's coming out of the church. I want to say that again. What's happening in the church is more important than what's coming out of the church. 
Because the priority is for us to encourage and build one another up. That's where it starts. If that's not happening on the inside, who cares what's happening on the outside? The Lord is not delighted with that. He's not pleased by it because, as, he, as, as we've heard in John 13 many times, God's priority, when he looks at the church, God's priority is not the church running out there and, and, and um, just talking to people about Jesus. We think that. What God's priority is for us is to demonstrate the truth of Jesus. Not to just run out there talking about Jesus. Talk is cheap. What he wants is the church to be a demonstration of Jesus. And what does that demonstration of Jesus look like? Building one another up. Loving one another so that the world sees a model of genuine divine love expressing itself through human beings who've been changed by the transforming power of the Holy Spirit because of their faith in Jesus Christ. That is what changes the world. And that is what Paul is trying to get these believers to understand. Encourage and build one another up. Hebrews 10. 24 through 25 gives us this passage. It says, and let us consider, let us consider, think about it, meditate on it. Let us consider, use your imagination. Let us consider how we may spur one another on. I like what the New American Standard Version says, is let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds and it says in verse 25 of hebrews 10 let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing even though covid compliance requires us to not come together as we normally do we can still be together virtually we can still be together thank god through the technologies that he has allowed to exist we can still be together we'll talk about that in a minute let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Today we are closer to the return of Jesus than we ever have been in the history of the world. And tomorrow will be even closer if tomorrow comes. My understanding is that in God's prophetic calendar, there is nothing else that needs to happen before Jesus comes back. It's just a matter of God's timing now. There's no prophetic thing that needs to happen. So we don't know that day when the Lord will come like lightning in the sky, as we just read in this verse, in this passage here in 1 Thessalonians 5. But it says, encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Let me remind those of you who've heard me speak on this subject uh, many times of a little phrase that I really love that has been very helpful to me and helpful to me in explaining the role of each part in the body. Remember how I said, I think it was last year, a year before last, I was talking about how each one of us, each one of us has an R and an N. You know, in, in order for God's healthy church plan to work optimally, in order for it to work optimally, the body needed to be designed in such a way that each part could both receive and give the nutrients of love. This doesn't work unless every part is needy and every part has resources to give. So the R stood for resources and the N stood for needs. And all of us walking around have R and N on our chest, in our spirits, in our DNA, if you will, our Christian DNA. The R stands for resources to give, resources to offer. And the N stand for, stands for needs to be met. And many of us value one over the other, or we think we have one but not the other, or we, we, we see ourselves in a, in a certain way where we're not holding both of those equally. And the reality is a healthy, mature believer 
as we grow towards maturity, we are able to hold both of those out with confidence and, and without shame and without shrinking away, without feeling in some way either superior because I've got resources to give or inferior because I have needs to be met. We are all walking around as needy um, resource givers, if you will. And we need to be able to embrace both. So if you're walking around thinking, I can help everybody, but nobody can help me, or I don't need anybody's help, that's unbalanced. That's not healthy. And if you're walking around saying, I'm so needy, I can't help anybody else, that's unbalanced. You don't have a clear view of what this verse is talking about, the one in Ephesians, where it talks about each part doing its work, and it builds the body up in love. Each part. None excluded. That's why I like the inclusiveness of it. So all of us are walking around with this R and this N. And if we're valuing one over the other, say, Lord, help us. Help me to appreciate my neediness. Because that makes room for your love to be distributed to me. And many times you want to use a human vessel to do that. And thank you, Lord, for blessing me with resources. Thank you for gifting me. Thank you for giving me the privilege of being able to meet the needs of others, to be a blessing to someone else. Thank you for putting that. That's your love that you placed in me. The love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So thank you for putting your love in me and allowing me to assist you by loving your people. When you sense your growing need for other believers, you're moving towards greater maturity. When you sense your growing need for other believers, you are moving towards greater maturity. You see, maturity in Christ is not independence. Maturity in Christ is dependence. Amen. Dependence upon him and on the, on the means that he offers to care for us. And maturity, be, 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 maturity becomes a matter of recognizing that as a divine work and growing in my sense of neediness for other believers. On the other hand, when you sense a growing value for what you contribute, you're also moving towards greater maturity. So I can stand here before you and say, I'm tired. <laughs> I can stand here before you and say, you know what, I don't care how much stuff that I've done or, or how much I know, I need encouragement. And I'm not ashamed to say it. I need Brother Avon. Sometimes I'll send him a little text just to stay in touch. You still out there, brother? You know, I, I need to know. I need to, I need to feel the touch of my brothers and sisters. I need that. If it's not physically, I need it spiritually because that's how God has designed me. But you know what? I also know I have something to give. I know that. So I'm writing on Monday. I'm writing on Wednesday. I'm writing on Friday. I'm writing on Tuesday and Thursday, too, but I'm not posting it. You know, I'm, I, am, I am thoroughly aware that God has blessed me with resources to give. But I'm also very much aware that I have needs that need to be met by the Lord's people. And as our, our sense of need for one another and our sense of the value of what we contribute grows, that's a reflection of maturity. Your experience is coming in line with God's truth. That's what's happening. That's, that's why it's maturity. It is coming in line with what Ephesians 4, 16 says is true of us. That each one of us is a part of the body and we need, we need help in building one another up in love uh, we, we, need the others to, we need others to build us up in love, and we have resources to do the same with them. So how do we deliver this vital encouragement to each other? Say, well, Pastor, I hear you. How do we deliver it? Well, there's many, 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 many ways, infinite number of ways, but I thought of these four S's that can kind of help. How do you deliver this encouragement? You want to participate in this. You want to say, okay, I got you, Pastor. I want to value this more. I want this more operational in my life. I want to do more than know about it. Well, I can say that you're probably doing more than you realize right now. 
just by being you. Just by being you. Some people come to church and they think, well, I need to do some more. I need to do some more. And they don't realize that sitting there, they're just luminescent. And they're just, they're just glowing with the love of Christ. And that their very presence is a ministry to others. Their smile. Their hug. Their corny jokes. <laughs> <laughs> all of that it's you it's who God has made you but if you want to hone it if you want to think about it more specifically here's the here are these four S's that I thought about that were helpful to me first of all say it you want to build up the body say it you know if you're thinking something encouraging about somebody I've said this many times if you're thinking something encouraging about somebody say it Share it with them. Send them a text message. You know, we have such instant communication means right now. Sometimes when I am walking and spending time with the Lord, I will, the Lord will place somebody on my mind and it'll bring a smile to my face. And I'll just stop and I'll just say, you know, I'm thinking about you and send a text real quick. Done like that. But it is a way of me building up the body of Christ. It doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be take a whole lot of time. It's just say it. If you're thinking it, say it. Give it to them. Give it up. They don't know what you're thinking unless you say it. <laughs> so if you're thinking it, if you're feeling it, if it's making you smile, why not make them smile? If thoughts of them are making you smile, why not let them participate since they're the cause of it? <laughs> say it. And then sing it is another one. Some of y'all are singers and Thank God for Marco Polo. Some of y'all get on there and sing and, and, and bless us. Sometimes it's solo. Sometimes it's with a backtrack. Sometimes it's just one verse. Well, if the Lord has given you a, vo a, a voice, sing it to encourage the body. Serve it is the other S. So say it, sing it, serve it. Some of us deliver encouragement through our service. That's what God has given us. I mean, all of us in some ways do that, but some of us are more focused on service. We're not necessarily big verbal people. We're not big social people, but our service. But do it as a means of building up the body of, of Christ and recognizing where that plays. Where, recognize the value of that. You remember I said I'm not trying to tell you anything new? I'm trying to get you to see the value, to, to raise the value of that. So when you're serving, don't just see that it's got to be done. Think of it as building the body of Christ and celebrate that. Thank you, Lord, for allowing me to build up your body by serving. And then share it is the final four, the final S. So say it, sing it, serve it, and share it. And what do I mean by that? Um, excuse me a minute. I just went over to our altar. And we have an altar here on the right where we have these stones. And these stones represent our mutual uh, commitment to three principles, to three faith objectives that the Lord has given us as a church. The first is knowing the Lord better, that we're all here to get to know him better. The second one is for all of us to grow in our love for one another as the Lord directed. And the third one is that each of us will buy into the truth that we're talking about right here, that God has equipped each one of us with gifts to contribute and that he would release those gifts in our church. So I'm holding up Tracy Simon Sinclair's <laughs> stone here. We've all bought into this, that what we want to do is to get to know the Lord better, to love each other more, and to let the Lord use us to build up his body by activating the gifts and the talents and the different things that he's placed within us. The first one of those items, again, is getting to know the Lord better. And you hear me talking about that every Sunday. And the Lord knows that I am trying to fit it into every message I can. I, I, I will try to shoehorn that thought into every single time I stand up here because to me, that is, the, that is the primary prize of life, is knowing him. 
And, and I can't even tell you why, because then I'll start preaching about it. Except that's number one on the list. But do you know what? I don't want us to think that that being the primary thing, that getting to know the Lord better is an isolated thing. It's not. It's not just us getting alone in our quiet times with the Lord and spending time with him personally. That is a huge part of it. I do that every single day. That's a huge part of it. But this week, I was thinking about that objective of knowing the Lord better is something that he wants each one of us to enhance in one another. What I mean by that is that each one of our experience of him, each one of our experience is enhanced by our fellowship with each other. As we meet together, as we talk together, as we fellowship together, our knowledge of him, our understanding of him grows. That's why Bible study is not a lecture. That's why I haven't designed Bible study as a lecture. I, I don't stand up in Bible study on Thursday night and speak for 20 minutes. I don't, it's not a sermon. I introduce an idea. I may teach on a point or two. I may, may make some kind of a, a, a statement about something to work through a passage. But 90% of Bible study is de designed to help each one of us share our stories with one another. That's how it's structured. And that's why I wrote our adult Sunday school curriculum with a discussion format in order to facilitate this shared knowledge with one another of who Jesus is to us so that we get to know him better through our fellowship with one another. We need to hear each other's stories. That's not being polite. That's being biblical. That's allowing the body to do what it does, to build itself up in love. Here's another thing to consider. Don't wait, and this is an important one too. Don't wait for somebody to call you. Don't wait. You don't have to wait for someone to call you to receive encouragement. You can reach out <laughs> and call them. I need encouragement. <laughs> I mean, sometimes we think that it's, it's really of God when someone just happens to be thinking of us at a moment when we really have a need, and that is the Lord. But it doesn't have to be confined to that kind of mystical happening. You know, if you need encouragement, you can call somebody up and say, hey, I need some encouragement. What's the Lord teaching you these days? Where are you at in your walk? What's happening with you? What verses you've been thinking about? What, will you pray for me? We can reach out to others. You know, I think about Paul, and you can write this down, Romans 1, 11 through 12. Paul said, I long to see you, writing to the Romans. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I, may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. So you see Paul here, Paul's writing these epistles and he's this great scholar and he says, I want to come because I've got something I want to share with you. But I also want to come because I want to be mutually encouraged because you've got something to share with me. So may God work it out for us to get together so that we're mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Now, if Paul's example isn't enough, maybe we'll be persuaded by Jesus' example, which we find in Luke 22, verse 28, where Jesus said just before he went to the cross, you are those who have stood by me in my trials. You are those who stood by me in my trials. And then shortly after that, he said, wait and pray with me. I'm about to go into this dark place. Wait and pray with me. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. There's no shame. You see, he wasn't worried that the disciples would think less of him as the Messiah because he was troubled to the point of death. 
He wasn't worried that they would say, well, boy, where's your faith, Jesus? Good grief. I mean, come on. You've been telling us that this is going to happen all along. Why are you now troubled? You know what? He did not see it as some weakness in order to be calling upon those around him to support him. So let me put it this way, another make it plain statement. As we grow in our individual relationships with God, as we experience the joy of knowing him personally, individually, let us not fall prey to the idea that we have so much of the joy of Jesus flowing through us that we don't need each other. <laughs> don't fall prey to that notion. Because see, the devil, as I've said before, one of the things he likes to do is if he cannot put the brakes on, he'll step on the accelerator and take you far past where you need to go. And so in this idea of each one of us needing a personal relationship with Christ, and as we talk about it here in ministry, and as I pray for each one of us, that God would continue to blossom that in each one of us, that that would be the reservoir, that that would be the resource from which we draw to encourage one another. Let's not fall prey to the idea that we've got so much of the joy of Jesus flowing through us that we don't need each other, because that's just not true. We do. And part of the way that he puts that joy in us Part of the way he replenishes that is by giving us one another. And here's the final thing I want to say. Remember that it's divine love. It is divine love. 2 Corinthians 7, 5 through 7 tells us this. For when we came into Macedonia, this is 2 Corinthians 7, 5 through 7. Paul said, when we came into Macedonia... This body of ours had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn, conflicts on the outside, fears within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you had given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. What is Paul saying? He's saying the comfort from Titus and the comfort of Titus came from God through these Corinthian believers. You know, when I was a younger believer, I just was so excited. And next week, by the way, marks the 42nd anniversary. And it is literally on that date, September 27th. It represents the 42nd anniversary of my coming to know the Lord. And, uh, and I remember the day as though it was just yesterday. But I remember as a young believer being so excited about my new faith and so eager to discover what was happening inside of me because my life was just changing and something had happened to me. And I wanted to find out what it was. And I, and I was just absorbing everything I could from this little group of believers that I was associated with. And I remember my first Christian, my first Christian conference took place that fall, late November, early December sometime. And it was in York, Pennsylvania. And we, coming from Michigan, we drove to York, and then we found out that D.C. was just a short way, ways away, and I'd never been to Washington, so a bunch of us decided we'd get in a van and just drive down to Washington, D.C. And I was excited about seeing the Capitol and the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Monument and all the, the sites of Washington, D.C. And so we get in this van, and we're driving the couple hours, whatever it is from York, we're driving down, and there's maybe six or seven of us seven of us sitting in this van, and we began to talk about our relationship with the Lord and how we come to know the Lord, what had happened, when did we discover Christ, and how, you know, how did we become believers and things of that nature. And by the time we got to D.C., I mean, it was anticlimactic. It really was. Once I got there, I was so filled up with joy and excitement and vibrancy and fellowship that when I saw the Capitol, I was like, hey, Capitol. You know, it was almost like it, it really didn't have that same magic. Something more magical had happened within me sharing these testimonies with these believers. And that excitement carried on after the conference was over. There was a group of believers who lived on this one street, and there was like six or seven believers um, in different houses on either side. It was like Christian Street. And I remember going from house to house because they knew me and everything and loved me. And I was going from house to house and nobody was home. 
And I was like, oh, man, I, where is everybody? And I was feeling like, oh, boy, feeling sort of down. And I remember very clearly, it was like the Lord spoke to my heart and said, Dan, hold up a minute. The reason you are so excited about them is because I'm in them and I'm in you. You see, we can idolize anything. <laughs> we can even idolize one another's love. That's why it's important for us to see that it is divine love that is being given through human uh, delivery. And uh, we're not substitutes for God's love. We are conduits of it. We're not substitutes. No human being can be a substitute for God's love. We can only be conduits of it. God is love. And so it's always wise to thank him for his love as it flows to us from others and as it flows through us to others. It's always good to recognize that it's his love and to give him thanks as such. So I'm done. We're not in this thing alone. We were never intended to be in it alone. God has placed his spirit within us and his people around us. And the love of God is the most powerful force on earth. And the amazing thing is that he has deposited in each one of us to deliver first of all, to the body of Christ as a display to the world to draw it to himself. So God bless you. Consider these things and may the Lord give it fresh meaning and fresh inspiration to you as you continue in your journey as a partner with him in building up his body. Let's say a word of prayer. And then I'm going to release you to our dear sister, Grace White. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this truth. Thank you for each member of your body. Lord, we know that you have done an amazing thing by calling us to belong to you. But you didn't just stop, Lord, with settling our eternal destiny. You've equipped us to handle life here on earth. You know we're in enemy territory. You know that we're down here where the whole world is under the control of the evil one. You know that we can't do this on our own, so you, you promised and you delivered your Holy Spirit to live inside of us. We thank you for his presence in us. What an amazing gift he is. How he refreshes and reminds and encourages and directs and teaches and counsels us. Thank you for his eternal presence in us. And we thank you for one another. For making us a part of a body. For not leaving us here. For recognizing that we can't just live on spirituality in a vacuum. Thank you, Lord. That we, we need to see a physical representation of your love. And so you have allowed us to be that physical rep representation to each other. Lord, help us to be honored by the privilege. Help us to value what you've placed in us. And help us to, to, to be privileged to share it with one another. And Lord, help us to be good receivers. Help us to be open to receiving your love. Not just, Lord, from the pages of Scripture, but from the hearts and the bodies of your people. So we thank you for this blessing today, and we trust you to make it relevant to us throughout this day and the week to come. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I love you all. It's been great sharing with you. May God bless you for the rest of your day and stay tuned for Sister Grace White.